Now, we've discussed capacitors before, and specifically, we looked at a lot of the properties of capacitors, how they're designed, how they can store energy, and things of that nature. But now we need to start talking about how do they affect circuits if we place them into them. So let's have a couple of brief reminders. A capacitor is a device that's used to store electric charge and electric potential energy, and we can use that in a variety of different ways. We can store a bunch of charge and then release it in a quick burst of current. We can use the charging and discharging process to alter how the circuit behaves over time. More on that in a second, uh, etc. And this is the circuit symbol for a capacitor. It's these two parallel lines here, and we need to be careful because this looks very similar to the symbol for a battery. So you need to be very, very precise that when we're drawing a, a capacitor that the lines are the same length, and when we're drawing a battery, they need to be clearly different lengths. We don't get these two confused. Now, some terminology we need to make sure we keep in mind is that capacitors have something known as a capacitance, uh, which is abbreviated with a capital C, which is a measure of how well a specific capacitor will store charge based on the design of the capacitor, such as the size of its plates, the distance between the plates, and if there's a dielectric inserted between those plates. And the relationship between this charge stored and the capacitance is Q equals C delta V, where Q is the charge that will be on each plate in coulombs, delta V is the voltage across the capacitor, and C is the capacitance in farads, which is really a coulomb per volt. And lastly, just to relate this to the electric potential energy stored in the electric field of the capacitor, which would be in units of joules, we have these three equations here, that UC is equal to 1 half Q delta V, equal to 1 half C delta V squared, and 1 half Q squared over C. So let's start off by talking about how a circuit will behave if we stick an uncharged capacitor into it. So let's look at this fairly simple circuit here. We've got a battery with voltage delta V. It's connected to, this is a capacitor, and then that's connected in series to a resistor. And we have an open switch here. We're going to say that this capacitor is initially uncharged. And the question is, well, what's going to happen immediately when we close the switch? Well, when we close it, we're going to notice that um, immediately charges are going to start being pulled from the battery so that we can start getting charges on each plate of the capacitor. So we're going to immediately see a flow of charge on each side of the capacitor. And in fact, that flow is going to be so big that it's essentially as if the capacitor is not even there. So, if we want to know how big is the current for this initial instant, this initial current, we can just treat this capacitor like it's a wire. Just treat it like it's not even there. And then we can just measure this current by figuring out, okay, I've got this resistor has some resistance R, so the I will be the delta V over the battery over the R of the resistor. And additionally, the delta V of the resistor, the voltage across the resistor, will match that of the battery because Kirchhoff's loop rule show, tells us that we have to lose as much energy in the resistor as we gain from the battery. Now I'm going to go ahead and erase these marks here. But the idea, though, is that initially the capacitor behaves just like a wire. Essentially, we just ignore it. Now that's only for the initial instant, though, because immediately what's going to start happening is we're going to start storing charges on the plates of the capacitor. And when that happens, we start getting a delta V across the capacitor. And it's not going to be very big initially. It's going to start pretty small. But when that happens, that reduces the delta V that's available to the resistor. And additionally, it reduces the current because as more charges start to become stored on the plates, well, less charges are being pulled. So that slows down that flow. All right, so let's go ahead and go to the, as more time progresses, well, that's going to be uh, even more exacerbated, that as we start storing more and more and more charges, as more time increases, the delta V across the capacitor is going to increase even more, and the delta V across the resistor is going to become even smaller, and in turn, the current across the resistor is going to become even smaller, because now we're barely pulling any charges from the battery anymore. And finally, after a long, 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 long time, the delta V of the capacitor will match that of the battery. 
So the delta V of the capacitor will now have the same voltage across it as the battery does. The current will go to zero because now that the capacitor is charged, it's not pulling any charges anymore. And so there's no voltage across the resistor either. Now, one thing I want to note is that when we do this, once again, this is the positive and negative side of the battery, that this ultimately, what we've created is in essence, a battery that is flipped in the opposite direction. So if we want to look at Kirchhoff's loop rule here, I could say, well, we gain some voltage here. And as we go around, this is a loss in voltage, because really it's just voltage directed in the opposite direction. So they cancel out. And lastly, what we want to notice here is that after a long time, because this becomes fully charged, we can essentially treat the rest of the circuit as if this capacitor is essentially like an open circuit, like a break. And if there was a break, there would be no current. And that's exactly what happens here. Once it's fully charged, nothing's going to flow anymore. Now, one thing I want to notice, we say after a long time, what we often call that is steady state, meaning that eventually when the capacitor is charged, everything reaches constant values. The current becomes zero, the voltage matches that, the battery, etc. They're, they're not fluctuating anymore. So let's go through a couple of examples to see how exactly this will work. So let's consider this circuit right here. We have a battery of 10 volts and we have got multiple switches. We've got one switch and we have a parallel branch. In one branch we have a 5 ohm resistor and another switch, switch B. And then the other branch we have a 10 millifarad capacitor and then those recombine and they go through a 20 ohm resistor and we're going to say at time t equals zero switch a is closed so we're going to say that this switch closes here and switch b though is going to be left open and the question is what's the current through each resistor initially and what is the current through each resistor a long time later essentially after the capacitor becomes fully charged so let's go ahead and look at the initial values first. Well, initially, well, if we look, this switch is closed, but this one is still open, so no current will go through this branch to begin with because it is open. It's an open circuit. It's a break. So we could say, oh, okay, well, then the current initially through the 5 ohm resistor will just be zero. But what about the current through the 20 ohm resistor? Well, remember, when we have, this is initial, so the capacitor is uncharged, we can essentially just treat it like a wire. We can pretend it doesn't even exist. And if it doesn't exist, well, all the current, therefore, is going to flow through this 20 ohm resistor, and we're just going to pretend like nothing else is happening. And if that's the case, to calculate that current, I can say, well, all the voltage of the battery needs to go be expressed through this 20 ohm resistor. I have the resistor is 20 ohms, and I can calculate that the current should be 0.5 amps, 10 volts divided by 20 ohms. Now, second question, though, is what happens a long time later? So steady state, in other words, when the capacitor is charged. Well, when the capacitor becomes charged, a couple things here. One, we still haven't closed branch B or switch B. So the 5 ohm resistor is uh, still zero because that switch isn't closed. But once this capacitor becomes fully charged we act like it's a break in the circuit essentially it's not going to allow any current to flow so what's the current through the 20 ohm resistor well also zero well let's look at the same circuit but now let's say at time t equals zero both switch a is closed and switch b is closed and we have the same questions that what is the initial current through each of these resistors and what is the current a long time later or the steady state current eventually between these two resistors so let's start off by looking at the initial values now when we close both of these switches we now have two pathways for current to go one through the capacitor and one through the resistor but remember, when the capacitor is uncharged, it acts like a wire. And so we can essentially say, if it acts like a wire, that we've essentially shorted out the 5 ohm resistor. So initially, the current through the 5 ohm resistor will still be zero, because all of the charge is going to go through this path. What about through the 20 ohm resistor? Well, if you know, we're not for just ignoring this one because it's shorted out. Well, then it's going to behave exactly like it previously did. So it'll be the entire voltage of the battery over the 20 ohm resistor. We get 0.5 amps once again. Now, the question is, what happens, though, when we have steady state? Well, after a long time, this capacitor becomes fully charged and we can treat it 
like a break in the circuit. And if we treat it like a break in the circuit, well then all the current is just going to go through one path. And essentially it's going to go through those two resistors together as if they were a series combination. So I can just say the total voltage of the battery is going to be 10 volts. The resistance of this combination is 25 ohms because it's 20 ohms plus 5 ohms. And they have to have the same current because they're in series, so the current through each resistor will be 0 0.4 amps. And we notice, once again, some important trends. For the series resistor, initially it has a huge flood of current going through it as the capacitor is charging, has very, essentially just acts like a wire. Over time, that's going to eventually stop because the capacitor becomes charged, so that value is going to go down. But for the one in parallel, initially it's shorted out, but at the end, current is going to start being forced through it as the capacitor becomes charged, so its current is going to steadily rise as time goes on. And this is actually the exact same situation we just saw where both A and B are closed, but the question is how much charge is going to be stored on each plate of the capacitor a long time later, aka when it's fully charged. Well, we already found the currents in these two branches, and the thing is, though, is that we have to remember that with Kirchhoff's loop rule, we've got one loop going through the capacitor and one loop going through this resistor. And that tells us that the voltage across the resistor must match the voltage across the capacitor. Well, what's the voltage across the resistor? Well, I can just use Ohm's law. I've got the current as 0.4 amps, the resistance is 5 ohms. I multiply those together and get 2 volts. So now I know that the voltage across the capacitor must also be 2 volts. If I have a voltage, I have a capacitance, so you can easily calculate the charge just by doing Q equals C delta V. And when we do that, we see that we get the Q is equal to 20 millicoulombs. Now that was looking at a single capacitor and a circuit. But what happens when we start to do combinations of capacitors? And there's a couple of different ways we can do that, just like combinations of resistors. And the first one we're going to look at is a parallel combination of capacitors. So each capacitor is in its own loop with the battery. Now we know from Kirchhoff's loop rule therefore that the voltage across each branch is the same so that tells us that the voltage across each capacitor must also be the same. Now if we want to look at how much charge is stored in this entire system of capacitors well that total amount of charge is going to equal to the charge on each respective capacitor added together. So the total charge is going to be Q1 plus Q2 plus Q3, and we have an equation for Q, which is C delta V, and I've got the capacitance for each capacitor, and they have this, all have the same voltage, so it would just be delta V, delta V, delta V, and if I want to simplify this, I can pull all the delta Vs out, and we see we get this term here, C1 plus C2 plus C3, and this is essentially the equivalent capacitance of this circuit. So if I was to pull out those three parallel capacitors and replace them with a single capacitor, how would I get the same amount of charge stored? Well, I would have to have a capacitor with this equivalent capacitance. And you'll notice that the equivalent capacitance is just a summation. So for capacitors in parallel, we just add the capacitances together to get the total capacitance. So you just add C1 plus C2 plus C3. And that means that the more capacitors we add in parallel, well, you're going to steadily be increasing the capacitance, and that's actually going to steadily increase the amount of charge that can be stored, as well as the amount of energy that can be stored. So for every capacitor we add in parallel, more charge is stored, more energy is stored. And what you'll notice is that this equation is essentially identical to the equivalent resistance of resistors in series. So capacitors in parallel behave like resistors in series. But what happens if we combine these different capacitors into a series combination, if we make them a part of one loop? Now to really see what's happening here, we kind of need to focus a little bit on as time goes on as these capacitors start to charge. So initially, before we essentially have like imagine that we have just connected these capacitors to the battery, so before any charge has flowed, positive and negative charges are distributed throughout the wires evenly. Remember the wires are neutral, they don't have a net charge, so all of the positive and negative charges are distributed fairly equally. Well, as time goes on, what's going to happen? Well, as time goes on, the battery is going to start pulling negative charges to this side and positive charges to this side. And if we look, that we should start getting positive charges on this 
particular plate, and we should start getting negative charges on this particular plate. Well, when that happens, once I start putting positive charges here, that's going to pull negative charges from the space in between, the wire in between, towards it, essentially inducing that. And additionally, on this one, that's going to pull positive charges towards this plate. But what happens to this capacitor in between? Well, these positive charges here are going to push the positive charges away, and additionally, they're going to be attracted to the leftover negative charges. And the negative charges here will be pushed away from those, and they'll be attracted to the leftover positive. So we notice that charges begin to be separated on each individual capacitor. But as time goes on, you know, this is going to continue, and we're going to start separating this even more and even more and even more. But we have to keep in mind that there are still charges in the wires. You know, we're not going to run out of those. So when does this process stop? Well, imagine, okay, these have... I wrote C1, C2, C3, and even though they're drawn the same, pretend like they have different capacitances, which means they can store different amounts of charge. Let's say C1 and C3 are really big, they can store a lot of charge, C2 cannot store very much. Well, the thing is, is once C2 reaches its maximum, it's not going to be able to hold any more charge. And if it can't hold any more charge, we're going to get some charges here that don't have anywhere to go. And they're not going to join the bigger capacitors because if we start doing that, well, like for instance, this negative charge is not going to move over here because it's going to be more attracted to the ones that are already separated there than the ones across the capacitor. So essentially, whichever capacitor is smallest limits how much total charge can be stored. That for every capacitor here, they will reach the same charge value on all the plates. That's the only way we can keep the charge conserved. For instance, if I had different values here, well, then they would redistribute to be equal, but that would change these, and that would change that, etc. So, the idea here is that each capacitor will store the same charge. And now, granted, they have the same charge, they have different capacitances, that means they have different voltages. But the voltage across the battery has to equal delta V1 plus delta V2 plus delta V3. And how can we reconfigure that? Well, remember we know Q is equal to C delta V, so delta V is equal to Q over C, so I can say Q over C1 plus Q over C2 plus Q over C3. And additionally, let's say we were to pull those three capacitors out and replace them with a single equivalent capacitor. Well, because we can only have so much charge stored on these plates, we know for a fact that if we were to place it with a single capacitor, the charge on these plates would be Q and minus Q as well. But that's going to be over this equivalent combination for the series. And if we look, all these Qs will cancel. And we are left with 1 over the series capacitance equals 1 over C1 plus 1 over C2 plus 1 over C3. And that should look very, very familiar because this essentially looks a lot like the equation for the equivalent resistance for resistors in parallel. But this is the equivalent capacitance for capacitors in series. That 1 over the series combination is equal to 1 over C1 plus 1 over C2 plus you know, whatever. And you have to remember, though, that once you find this summation of the inverses, you have to take the inverse of the last one to get the right value. And that's easy to forget. So I'm oftentimes going to write it like this. That's C1 to the minus 1 plus C2 to the minus 1 plus C3 to the minus 1, etc., etc., etc. Take minus 1 to the whole thing. Therefore, that as we add more and more capacitors in series, that actually decreases the total capacitance, and that decreases the charge and the energy that can be stored. So let's go ahead and practice for just a second, and let's look at two different combinations of capacitors, each made of the same components. And the question is how much charge can be stored in each combination? So I have a 10-volt battery, and I have a 20 millifarad and a 5 millifarad capacitor either connected in parallel or connected in series. So let's start with the parallel combination. If I want to find the equivalent capacitance, I just add those values together. And of course, that means that the equivalent capacitance is bigger than each individual capacitance, meaning that more charge will be capable of being stored than if each one was by itself. 
Now, if I want to figure out, okay, how much charge is stored, I just use Q equals C delta V, where I've got that equivalent capacitance times the voltage, and we get a total charge stored of 0.25 coulombs. Now, how is that charge split up? Well, each one has 10 volts going across it. They have their respective capacitances. So you could calculate how much charge is stored on each respective capacitor. And I'll go ahead and tell you, I believe it is 0.2 coulombs and 0.05 coulombs. So they're not going to, the charge will not be split evenly. The voltage will be the same, but since the capacitances are different, the charge will be different. Okay, let's look at the other combination when they're in series. Let's find the equivalent capacitance. So I'm going to do C1 to the minus 1 plus C2 to the minus 1, the whole thing to the minus 1. And when we do that, we get an equivalent capacitance of 0 0.004 farads, or, point, or what would that be, 4 millifarads. Meaning that if we look, the total capacitance is less than each respective capacitor, meaning that the total charge stored will be less. And to find that total charge, we once again just do Q equals C delta V, and we get a total charge stored of 0 0.04 coulombs. And that would be the charge on this plate, for instance, that would be negative, and on this plate, and negative. That is what that is telling us. Now, once again, we got different capacitors, but they have the same charge on each, so these voltages would be different, but they would have to add up together to be 10 volts. So what are our main takeaways for how capacitors behave in circuits? One, can we describe how the current through a circuit and the voltage across the capacitor changes as the capacitor charges? And can we therefore calculate various factors, uh, such as current, voltage across various pieces, etc., for a circuit with a capacitor that is uncharged, and then when it is fully charged. Remember when it's uncharged, we can say that's the initial values, and we can treat the capacitor like it's just a wire. When it is fully charged, those are the steady state values, and we can treat the capacitor like it's a break in the circuit because no more current can flow through whatever branch it's a part of. Lastly, can we determine and utilize the equivalent capacitance of capacitors in parallel and in series, first by finding that equivalent capacitance, and then using that to find various factors in circuits?